Good morning, church. My name is Jay Cordes. This is my wife, Laura Cordes. And uh, I'm going to ask everybody to please stand and receive the word of the Lord today. So our scripture today is Luke chapter 4, 1 through 15. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the river Jordan. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Then the devil had finished tempting Jesus. He left him until the next opportunity came. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogue and was praised by everyone. Thank you, God, for your holy word. You may be seated. Thank you, Jay and Laura. Many of you know that in addition to serving as elders, Jay and Laura, lead and have for some time led our premarital ministry, and that's an amazing gift that you've given us so many, and we are so thankful for you guys. Can we just appreciate them? They slipped out of class early to come down and read the scriptures for us, and man, love you guys so much. Hey, before we jump into the Word this morning, I want to share with you one other thing that's happening that's important and pertains to many of us uh, and is time sensitive. Here at Denver United, our vision is, of course, uniting across the spectrum to follow Jesus relentlessly and build His kingdom in Denver. From before we began, when God put the vision for this church in Denver in Mari's heart and mine, this was part and parcel of what we believe Jesus called us to, the work of unity. Jesus, as I've shared with you many, many times, prayed one prayer for us, the future of his church that is recorded in scripture, and it was that we would be one. And in our unity, the world would see the gospel on display. And unity has taken a variety of expressions in the evangelical church in modern America, and most often it's been, let's come together and do it my way, whatever the pastor's way is, right? And the pastor's usually indicative of the uh, largest portion of the congregation, or what we call the majority often. And so it's included a genuine and heartfelt welcome to all. Our heart at Denver United from the beginning has been to add to that sincere welcome a a work of equity. And while that word is loaded with perhaps sociological and political meaning right now, it's rooted in our understanding in Jesus' teaching when he said to his followers, people will come on that day to the banqueting table of the Lord. They'll come from the north and the south, from the east and the west, and they'll take their places at the table in the kingdom of heaven. And I think the point there is often missed that they're not coming to take our places, to the people of Israel who were the majority culture in that day and had little or no use for people of different ethnic backgrounds. They're not, it's not, he's not, he said, make no mistake, I'm not saying scooch over, make a hole and give up one of your places for a symbolic expression of unity. Hear me, they're coming to take their own places, places which belong to them. The kingdom of heaven is for all people, Jesus said. It's a house of prayer for all nations or it's nothing at all. I want nothing to do with an expression that's comfortable for me and people that look and descend from people like me and treat others as outsiders. Okay, that's a good place to agree. And so 
we've worked for years at creating authentic ownership, inclusion, equity for women and men, younger and older, richer and poorer, brown, black, and white, people who are from other nations as well as Americans. And some of the most meaningful and I think difficult work that we've done on those lines, we've done through a material that we've found that's been so helpful and so Uh, aligned with us, not only doctrinally, but in tone and heart, called Be the Bridge. Has anybody gone through Be the Bridge? A whole bunch of you have over the years. And um, what we're doing this semester, our Be the Bridge leadership team has collectively, we've heard from the Lord and for six months been planning toward this, a Be the Bridge 201 installment. So the 101 uh, uh, entry level beginning to discover and discuss this work in a safe honoring environment will return in the fall of this year. But for this spring, we're going to engage a sort of 201 initiative. So this is largely for people either who have been through the material or to whom it pertains in a particular way. And so this is sensitive. I'm undoubtedly going to announce it in a way that's a little clunky. I encourage you to hear the heart of what I'm saying, okay? And that is that the 201 course is in separate settings for the BIPOC community, which, as most of you know, is an acronym which stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, right? Speaking of people as majority and minority assigns a worth hierarchy that isn't at all Jesus' heart and isn't our heart. The white community, which in our space is the majority demographically, will have a... a 201 course in deepening our understanding of how to engage in a way that is authentic and sacrificial and leads toward ownership and equity and a more difficult and more costly unity than, hey, let's just all come together and do it my way. Are we good with that? And if that's hurtful or if that triggers things that have been inequitable in the past, let's just pretend like that's not the case and all sort of give amnesty and start now. Well, that's not the way we deal with one another in relationship in every other sphere. Why would it be in this sphere? And so that one um, is already in motion, and that's people who are alums of the Be the Bridge course. And then the second is specifically an intensive for the BIPOC community. And this is an opportunity uh, for ministry and compassion, care, hearing, and, and, and empathizing, and then uh, encouraging in a ministry context one another. And I exclude myself from this because, of course, I'm not a representative of the BIPOC community. Uh, in being able to show up in a whole and healed way and being able to care for one another in order to walk that journey rather than what often happens. And I I know this to be true, not because I read it in a book, but because so many of you have lovingly shared it with me that as a person of color, when I come to a, 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 a space around the subject of unity that features people from the, the white community, very often once people discover, oh, wow, this has been hard, this has been hurtful. Like we would discover something else is hurting someone we care about and we would say, hey, let me care for you. Once that happens, then the representatives of the BIPOC community are placed by default in a position of being a coach or trainer in how to do this work. Some of whom want that. And some of you are are not only willing and able, but have served in that capacity. Others say, you know what, I just, this is the first time I've really accessed this in in an integrated space. And this is a little tender. So the BIPOC intensive 201 course is for representatives, church members who are black, indigenous, uh, Latino, Latinx, people of color to have a a, a safe, encouraging ministry space. My friend Christopher Frierson, who lots of you know, who's been leading here from the beginning and leads not only um, professionally, but has vocationally in the church in this space is going to be giving leadership to that. And I I regret I'd have him up here sharing it with me. They're on vacation this morning. Um, He'll be back with us next week, he in Jerusalem. And then starting soon after, uh, sometime in mid-April, the BIPOC intensive will begin. So I'm sharing it now as a sort of save the date. Let's see. Uh, I think Will also knows some about this. Where are you, Will? I saw you. There you are. When does it begin? Do you know off the top of your head? April 16th. And which night of the week is it on? 
Tuesday. Okay, forgive the organic announcement. Sorry? And child care is provided. So it's on Tuesday evenings, beginning the 16th. And then uh, Christopher and Will are, are putting the team together. This is getting going organically. Uh, it's really wonderful curriculum. And it's, the goal is, is care, healing, empathy, equity, ownership, and working toward a unity that we not only experience in Jesus' name, but then hold out to the city as to what Jesus' kingdom and his church authentically looks like. Remember, his prayer for us is that we would be one and in our authentic unity. The world would see what the gospel actually looks like. So if you're interested in or would even be willing to hear more about the be the Bridge 201 BIPOC Intensive. Simply use the Connect card uh, on the back of your seat there and write that on there, anything to that effect. You can drop it in the boxes or give it to them out at the desk, and then our team will be in touch with you uh, with more details. Does that make sense? Anything I'm missing there, Will? That's the heart of it? Great. Christopher, Will, they'll tell you more about it, but really grateful that... This is a church that has, over the course of our 15 years, begun to look like what Mari and I saw from the beginning and what we believe heaven looks like, which is a house of prayer, a representative of God, a representation of God's children from all nations, all ethnicities, all stages of life, all places around the tracks, so to speak, and every other divide that tends to define us as Americans. That does not define us as the children of God. Amen? All right. <laughs> Thank God. Thank you for courageously coming to church together and being family and loving one another so well. We're going to jump into the word here. Jay and Laura read for us, as have some of the other elders in the previous weeks, this text, which is the the seminal text for the season of Lent in the church worldwide and throughout history. The big idea, of course, that we've lain from the beginning of March is that Jesus' way began and ended with surrender. We often note, especially at this time of year, how Jesus' way to the cross was emblematic of a surrender that characterized his ministry as Messiah. But from the beginning, that was Jesus' way. Here, as his first act in office, if you will, as Messiah, having just been baptized, enunciated by the Father's voice and the Holy Spirit's descent on him, his ministry publicly begun. The first thing he did was passive voice was to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he prayed and fasted and faced temptation from the enemy. I want to know Christ, the Apostle Paul said, much as Pam was just talking to us about, and the power of his resurrection by joining in a fellowship of his sufferings, by becoming like him at his death, by walking the road with him to the cross and dying with him is how we are to live with him. And in this passage, Jesus models a practical and, frankly, a replicable surrender. He faces temptations that are specific to him, relevant to us when you expand them, and he faces them with spiritual disciplines, the Holy Spirit with him and God strengthening him in prayer and in fasting. He disciplines his human flesh and models for us how to do the same into surrender and victory over temptation. Total surrender means cultivating the discipline to deny what would master us. That's what Jesus models here. Notice he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, as Jay read, and then he returned from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit, as Laura read. And so led out by the Holy Spirit, met by God there, strengthened as a man, doing what he did through the power of the Holy Spirit, because that's the way you and I would follow suit. We don't have God-likeness to grasp or not. And so he modeled for us in his human nature and then returned from that season of surrender, if you will, full of the Holy Spirit's power. Power to stand firm in the face of those temptations as they would come again and walk victoriously. 
As I've shared with you in the past couple of weeks, this is a message in three movements. Week one, or week two, I guess, was movement one, and that had to do with bread. The first temptation last week, Pastor Rice did an amazing job developing the second temptation. Movement two was power and glory, right? Throw yourself off the temple. No. Throw yourself off the temple is today. Sorry, I confused myself. Power and glory. All the kingdoms of the world can be yours. A shortcut to that which is your birthright. This morning is movement three, and that is, of course, significance. Throw yourself off, the devil said. Have you all yet seen Hamilton? It mercifully during COVID was on TV because the tickets were like 1,200 bucks if you wanted to go in, in on Broadway. I love, I, I mean, I loved it from beginning to end, but I think the most moving scene to me was when Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, who were rivals and striving for power against each other, were there together and each of them had had a, child, a child and that child softened them away in a way, but also brought out kind of their true colors. And Burr begins, dear Theodosia, do you remember? Someday you're gonna blow them all away. And then Hamilton comes in and they sing it together. And I think that's what's facing Jesus. You've been in obscurity for 30 years, but someday, coming soon, you're going to blow them all away. They're going to see who you really are. They're going to have to grapple with what you can actually do. Our key verses begin in 9. The devil took Jesus to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he'll order his angels to protect and guard you, and they'll hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot against a stone. And Jesus responded, the, spirit, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Now, this one I think is the subtlest of the three temptations. What is exactly the temptation here? Like throw yourself off a building? No, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> Easy temptation to resist if you're not God. But if you're God... Buildings, heights, time, space, flying, these things are nothing. Being trapped in human body is so like elementary. But there's, there's no fear of heights. There's no wondering what's going to happen. The temptation, it seems, is to wow them. Blow them all away. Let someday be today. To show them who you really are. Show them what you can actually do. Give them a little taste. And then they'll know. And then they'll fear. Then they'll worship you. And why the temple? He was in the wilderness. Could have taken him up to a rocky precipice in the mountains and said, jump off of that. No, no. It was the temple that he tempted him to jump off of. Not randomly chosen. Because who were Jesus' chief skeptics? They were the religious leaders, right? The people that populated the temple, that hung out there. The temple crowd. The ones that kept on going, yeah, but, yeah, but. Who are you and who gave you this authority to mess with us and our religious traditions? Go to the temple where everybody who's doubting and naysaying is going to be for the next three years and just put an end to the nonsense, Jesus faced the temptation to be spectacular, which he was, but to be spectacular specifically in the eyes of other people. That was the temptation. Do you see it? He faced the temptation to dazzle them, to wow them, to show them without any question or doubt, to end the need for faith. He said to Thomas, during the last week before the cross. No, this was, I'm sorry, the week after his resurrection when Thomas said, I won't believe, remember, unless you show me the holes in your hands and feet and the spear mark in your side. And Jesus did, and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, you believe because you've seen. Akin to throwing myself off the temple. Blessed are those, what? Who have not seen and yet have believed. That was the Jesus way. The Jesus way was what scholars call the messianic secret. 
As soon as somebody, often a demon first, would recognize, I know who you are, you're the son of God, he would say silence. And he would tell those who are healed and experienced the power of heaven, don't tell anybody. Have you ever wondered why? Why would Jesus not want them to go out and tell anybody? Because Jesus, being the son of God, remember that's how the devil identified him, and Jesus didn't oppose him on technicalities. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself off. Jesus didn't say, well, all right, I'm the son of man, okay? He knew that the devil knew that the devil knew that he knew that he was the son of God. But Jesus didn't identify as the son of God. What did he call himself over and over and over again? Anyone remember? The son of man. He didn't say the son of God has nowhere to lay his head. He said the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He leaned into his humanity and modeled for us how to live for God by doing everything that he did as a human being dependent on the Holy Spirit. Knowing what was coming at the end of that dark road to the cross, the temptation must have been tremendous to make clear once and for all his true identity. Because it was all a big misunderstanding, right? I mean, we grew up celebrating Palm Sunday. Did anyone grow up in a church where the kids waved palm leaves and processed through and we sang happy, upbeat, major key songs? We wanted the happy story. And then we kind of did a little bit on Good Friday for the faithful, like the second helping crowd. But then we skipped ahead to the next mountain peak of happiness. Very American of us. We like it to keep it on the up and celebrated Easter with more pastel colors and major keys and usually added horns to make clear the triumph in the vibes. But Palm Sunday was like misunderstanding Sunday. They were cheering and waving palm leaves, not for Jesus, the suffering servant, but for the one they thought was going to depose Caesar and take over freeing them from Roman occupation by force. Use some of that miracle power that raised Lazarus to get rid of that psychopath in Rome. As soon as Jesus made clear that he had no aspirations toward a coup d'etat, they turned on him, arrested him, and murdered him. The temptation must have been overwhelming at times to clear up the misunderstanding, shall we say, to take away the need for faith and lean into sight instead, to widen the narrow road and remove the subtlety and make the kingdom overt. This temptation was far from finished when Jesus left the wilderness. It would surface again and again throughout his ministry. Trained and strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit as he was during this season of surrender in the wilderness... Jesus repeatedly chose not to perform in order to earn people's approval. Matthew 12, one day, some teachers of the law and Pharisees came to him and said, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. He'd been doing plenty of miraculous signs, but he replied, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. All he had to do was do one in front of them, and presumably they'd been like, okay, all right, you got me. I've got nothing. You're right. I'm wrong. He wouldn't do it. Luke 20, he was teaching the people and preaching the good news and the leading priests, teachers of the law and elders came to him and demanded, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right? I mean, they teed it up for him high in the grass. And instead of saying, well, since you asked, let me go ahead and tell you and show you. Excuse me, I'm gonna climb up to the top of the temple. I'll be right back. Instead, he did that Jesus thing and said, let me ask you a question. (laughs) And they're like, well, we don't know. Because they couldn't really answer and keep up the charade. And so Jesus said, then I won't tell you by what authority I'm doing doing these things. He refused to be obtrusive and overt, to perform wonders that would end the discussion and force them into belief. Equipped by the wilderness surrender training that he experienced in this season, Jesus again and again said no to a shortcut to significance. Instead, he had this way of playing down dazzling for common, embracing 
misunderstanding and accepting rejection. Eugene Peterson put it this way, Jesus was a master at subversion. Until the very end, everyone, including his disciples, called him rabbi, which is fine. Rabbis were important, but they didn't make anything happen. No one said, there goes that rabbi who's changing the world. On the occasions when suspicions were aroused that there might be more to him than that title accounted for, Jesus tried to keep it quiet and said, tell no one. His ways are not like our ways, but his temptation is ours. Now, you got to look a layer deeper, especially for this third movement. We may not be tempted to hurl ourselves off an office tower, but we sure are tempted to try to win the approval of other people. We certainly are tempted to perform for their applause. The question this asks that we might as well address head on is, if this works though, what's the harm in it? Doing what God gave me to do, using my gifts and talents, maximizing for the kingdom so that people will elevate me and I can be more influential for Christ? Well, the challenge isn't the elevation of the influence for Christ. It's what happens to our hearts along the way because friends, we cannot please people and God. You can't serve two masters. Paul wrote, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God, if I were pleasing people, if that were my aim, I couldn't be Christ's servant. And when we perform for people's approval, when we follow that well-worn shortcut to significance, we end up losing sight of our actual significance in the process and something in us that is a, a spark and an ember of the imago Dei, the image of God, which we bear, dies in the process. We forget who we really are. Remember in the chapter before, which Risa referenced last week at Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and a voice came from heaven. The, the Father seldom does this. He broke through the continuum of eternity. And a voice came and said, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And you're like, yeah, but what's the significance of that? Jesus hadn't done anything. I mean, he'd made chairs and tables that were good, but he hadn't done anything related to his messianic destiny. He hadn't saved the people for his, from their sins, rather, as was prophesied about him. He hadn't reconciled the world to God. He had just carved tables and chairs. He had been an ordinary, mild-mannered Roman citizen. Nothing in him, as we're told in Scripture, that would have drawn people to himself. And the father, before he had done anything of significance, said, here's who you are. You are my son. And I am well pleased. You are enough. Being my son, bearing my image, that's what makes you significant. What you're going to do is important, but it cannot be confused with who you already are. And I think your heavenly father looks at you and says, you are my daughter. You are my son. You bear my image. You are the beloved. What you are to do in this world, getting healed, all things being made new, becoming reconciled to God and being an ambassador to others for this reconciliation. It's important, but listen, it's what you're to do do. It's not who you are. Who you are is fixed. It's established from the beginning, and it cannot be improved by whatever you might do. And when we take this shortcut to significance, performing for other people's approval, we lose what is essential and glorious in ourselves. Sinful human nature, though, it yearns to be seen as. Hmm. Am I back on? Yeah. It yearns 
It longs to be understood as important. It itches to perform and impress and show them what we can do and earn their approval. And this world that we live in, that we've been swimming in the waters of from birth, compounds that pressure. Like to go to another musical, remember Chicago? Did you see the, the, the movie version or did you see it when it came to Denver? Remember Richard Gere's character? Give them the old razzle-dazzle, razzle-dazzle them. And it, like shimmery hands and all that. They did that. It's so alluring. That's what the world says to us from birth. It says, give them the old razzle-dazzle, razzle-dazzle them. And it'll all be good. Yeah, I know. You didn't know I had musical theater chops. You're like, no, no, you don't, actually. <laughs> like, I kind of think I might a little bit. But the desire to dazzle, it burns in us, doesn't it? Finding significance someplace other than man's opinion is incredibly hard. And letting go of people's approval, it takes a deliberate surrender of significance. Thus, a season of surrender. Jesus' way was finding our life by losing it, walking the road to the cross as Pam pastored us in here a moment ago in order that we can share in the power of the resurrection. That is Jesus' way. That's why he went to the desert. In Matthew 16, and we'll end this series where we began, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And so a season of surrender. Many of us, all who are willing, without any sort of pressure, have been fasting, fasting something, fasting a day or a meal or a, something that brings us comfort. What happens when we fast? We learn to say no to the flesh, right? To want something and not have it. We walk with Jesus to the cross in our self-denial. Like little mini crucifixions, as Pastor Daniel put it. Every time we choose not to have dessert. So as to experience the power of the resurrection and like Jesus to leave the wilderness, to finish the season of surrender full of the Holy Spirit's power so that we don't have to face the familiar temptations one more time and go, well, this time I'm just going to white knuckle it, but I'm going to hold on. This time my willpower will be enough. Instead, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to train our humanity to be surrendered and strong in Jesus. This is the Jesus way. The Apostle Paul reflected at the end of his life, if we die with him, we will also live with him. And so I have a couple of questions for us to reflect on. One is, in what ways do you find yourself performing for people's approval? In what ways do you find yourself performing for people's approval? And a companion question is this, what does a surrender of significance look like for you? Let's just take a moment in our seats and quiet our hearts as we've practiced in the first quarter of this year. Like Jesus said, go to your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is in the secret place. The secret place is here. He is with you. If you would, please just close your eyes and still and quiet your soul. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come.
we're going to take a few moments as we close and pray for one another. You have the option either in a moment to form a little cluster. Maybe it's the couple of people you came with. Maybe you came by yourself and there's a couple of people in your row or in front of or behind you. Just form a little group and pray for one another for a few minutes. Or if you'd prefer, if that, um, if you prefer for any reason, you can sit quietly and, and pray yourself as the band leads us in, in the response time of worship. Perhaps just share with one another one thing. Maybe it's a word or a sentence as much or as little as you feel to be vulnerable about bread. That was movement one and provision or power and glory and looking for the shortcut to what God wants to give us or significance, the temptation to perform for other people's approval. Maybe to share something from this season of surrender and then take a, a minute just like we do here when I'm or Mari or one of us is leading you and invite the Holy Spirit to come. So you don't have to over-function, you don't have to perform in prayer or do or say anything specific and then lead you. And then let's just take a minute and in a couple of sentences each and pray for one another and then we'll close. Would you stand with me? If you prefer to pray alone or you can, to remain seated, that's perfectly fine too. Let's just form a couple of little clusters of two to four-ish. Take a few minutes and pray for one another. <laughs> 